I'll invite you to take your Bible and turn with me to the Gospel of Mark chapter 10. As you are locating Mark chapter 10, uh, we're coming to what's our last installment for this year's study in Mark. We started last year and we did a second section this year and we'll finish out next year uh, our study of this uh, gospel. Today we're in Mark chapter 10, if you'll follow along, verses 46 through 52, and then we'll begin our study after we pray this morning. Scripture says, And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a large crowd, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. When he heard that it was Jesus the Nazarene, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many were sternly telling him to be quiet, but he kept crying out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him here. So they called the blind man, saying to him, Take courage, stand up, he is calling for you. Throwing aside his cloak, he jumped up and came to Jesus. And answering him, Jesus said, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabboni, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. And immediately he regained his sight and began following him on the road. Father, we thank you now for our time in this study. Bless it, we pray. Open our hearts to your truth that we might be like Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. For a few years, my father helped run a homeless shelter in Alabama. It was called the Downtown Rescue Mission. Like all such places, they had their regular men that came through what some would call riffraff. Some were petty criminals or general troublemakers. Some were involved in drugs and other substance abuse. They also had their share of men who had physical handicaps, some mental disabilities who didn't have family and had fallen through the cracks of the system and were basically on their own. These two groups probably made up 98% of the residents. But every once in a while, a person would show up who didn't sort of fit the regular clientele. Sometimes for circumstances beyond their control or maybe just bad choices, they needed a place to crash for a night or a weekend. And they were men who just, in some ways, days before could have been any of our neighbors. There was a man who stopped through who was a professional artist. There were several university professors who, who needed a place to stay. There was one medical doctor who had gone bankrupt. There was even a guy who came through for a while who had been a troubleshooting engineer for NASA during the space race. You never quite knew when these men came in what their education or experience or talent or even intellect might have been. In Mark chapter 10, we meet a man who, if he were alive today, would have probably wound up in a homeless shelter. According to verse 46, he was physically disadvantaged. It calls him blind. We also know he was financially disadvantaged. It says he was a beggar. Verse 46 also says he had some family. He is the son of Timaeus, but clearly his kinfolk can't provide for him, therefore he's been forced to panhandle on the streets. But like those surprising men that my father met, there is more to this blind beggar than meets the eye. He's not a medical doctor. He's not a NASA engineer. But I would argue that he is a first-rate theologian. If I were to staff a seminary class and to, to find someone to teach a class on the person and work of Jesus, this might be the guy I would hire. Because Bartimaeus' Christology is impeccable. What the Pharisees don't get, what the crowds don't get, what even the disciples don't yet get, Bartimaeus gets about Jesus. And the question this morning is whether or not we will get it ourselves. 
If I may ask the question in another way, do you see what blind Bartimaeus sees? Here's a man who cannot see with the eyes in his head, but he, boy, can he ever see with the eyes of faith. Bartimaeus is stone blind, and yet he has crystal clear vision and 20-20 insight into who Jesus is. And my friends, I would argue that like Bartimaeus, it is infinitely better to see nothing clearly but Jesus than to see everything clearly but Jesus. Bartimaeus is just such a man. And so the question is, do you see what blind Bartimaeus sees. Now, before we can see what he sees, we need to see the situation. Notice verse 46. It tells us they came to Jericho. Now, there's a few things about Jericho that are important to know for this story. Jericho is, believe it or not, it's one of the oldest cities on planet Earth. Uh, It's one of those cities that, that has been around since basically the dawn of time. Now, if you know anything about Jericho, you probably know that the walls came a-tumbling down, right? Like many ancient cities, Jericho was built and destroyed, and then rebuilt and redestroyed, and rebuilt and redestroyed. So by the time you get to Mark 10, there's actually two Jerichos. There's the old city that overlaps with, the, with sort of the new inhabited city. I point that out because in verse 46, look closely, he says there that Jesus was entering Jericho. But if you read Matthew and Luke's account, it says he was leaving Jericho. Well, which is it? Exactly. He was leaving the old and entering the new, or leaving the new and entering the old. I don't know which one, but it's not worth losing sleep over. There's an easy explanation for that supposed contradiction. But as they come to Jericho, notice there's not just Jesus and the disciples. It also says, verse 40, there's a large crowd. Now, that's for two reasons. Jesus' growing popularity, which we've seen for 10 chapters. But also, and maybe we've lost sight of this as we've worked through Mark's gospel, but if you look at the timeline, we're now literally just weeks or days from Passover. Time's going to slow down. We've been seeing it pass in sort of months and months at a time, but now we're going to get into hours and days. And this is one of those cases where when Passover came, tens of thousands of pilgrims would begin to make the journey on holiday to Jerusalem and they would have to walk down the road here of Jericho. One last important note, Jericho was situated 800 800 feet below sea level. Jerusalem is 2,300 feet above sea level. And so the 12-hour hike from Jericho to Jerusalem was uphill, as your grandfather would say, both ways. Not really, but it was entirely uphill. And so there is a sense in which, get this picture, what you have here is this main thoroughfare. You have just hordes of religious people, this large crowd, who many are on holiday with money in their pockets, following along this road, having to walk really, really slowly, which is the kind of thing beggars fantasize about. Right? You see that? There is no better place, and that's why Bartimaeus strategically positions himself. Look at 46 again. Beside the road. He knows where the people will be and where the best begging can happen. Clearly, he wants to receive some money, but Bartimaeus will receive a treasure far more valuable. And my friends, we can likewise receive these priceless insights into who Jesus is. So the question is, do you see what blind Bartimaeus sees? The first thing that Bartimaeus sees in verses 47 and 48, Bartimaeus sees that Jesus is the one we've been waiting for. Jesus is the one we've been waiting for. Verse 47, when they heard that it was Jesus the Nazarene, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, you may know this, the name Jesus is sort of a, comes from the Old Testament name Joshua. And like the name Joshua today, Jesus was actually a fairly common name. If you go read ancient literature, there's a lot of Jesuses walking around 
at this time. And so there's a sense in which verse 47, though, makes it clear when he heard what? This isn't just any old Jesus walking by. This is Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus from Nazareth. Remember, Nazareth is a know-nothing podunk town in the middle of Nowheresville. Nathaniel said in John 1, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Well, something good did come from Nazareth. And through Jesus' teaching and miracles and reputation, He put that spot on the map and people could distinguish who He was because He wasn't just Jesus, He was Jesus the Nazarene. And Bartimaeus, no doubt, had seen and heard of, these mirac- had heard of these miracles and heard of these stories and heard of the things that Jesus has done uh, that we've noticed all the way through these ten chapters. And on that day, of all the hundreds of Jesuses walking around in the Middle East, that day the one that walked by was Jesus the Nazarene, the one he wanted to meet. Upon hearing it, it says in verse 47, he began to cry out. You can just imagine Bartimaeus being blind, hearing the large crowd coming and noticing what's happening and then hearing someone say the name Jesus and hearing Nazareth and maybe hearing miracles and stories and he begins to piece it together and says, oh, that's Jesus, that's, that's the one, he's the one. And so maybe at first he, he timidly tried to speak up and says, Jesus, But his words are completely drowned out by the passing parade of people. And so he clears his throat with a bit more gusto. Uh, Jesus! But they still don't hear him. And the longer he sits there, the more footsteps he hears and the sandals kicking up the dust he can can hear going by him. And who knows, maybe Jesus has already drifted on. Maybe he's further along in the crowd. Maybe he's missed him. And so he belts out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So verse 48, many were sternly telling him to be quiet. But he kept crying out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Some people mistreat the homeless by looking away from them. Others look at them and dismiss them. That's what this crowd did. They looked at him and said, shut up. Be quiet. We don't have time for you. He certainly doesn't have time for the likes of you. Quit yelling. Quit making a scene. But Bartimaeus is not discouraged. Jesus has never passed through Jericho before, and this may be the only time he comes through. And Bartimaeus can see that, can understand that this might be his only chance, and so he yells at the top of his lungs out of sheer desperation, Son of David, have mercy on me. I love his enthusiasm, but what I love more are his words. Here's what's great about these two verses. Notice He hears 47 that this is Jesus the Nazarene. But did you notice he doesn't call him Jesus the Nazarene? Two times he calls him what? Son of David. My friends, it is one thing to know the name of Jesus. It is a very different thing to know the identity of Jesus. He knows who this is. He not only knows where Jesus is from, more importantly, he knows where Jesus is going. And that's the throne of his father, David. He knows that this is the heir of of that whole royal plan of God. The heir of David headed into the city of David. By calling him son of David, here was a man who knew his Old Testament. This is the only time, by the way, this title is used in Mark's entire gospel for Jesus. In other words, Bartimaeus gets what what nobody else got. All of the messianic expectations, all of the Old Testament promises, all of Israel's future hopes and dreams were wrapped up into these three words, Son of David. Bartimaeus is confessing with these words that all the Old Testament predicted has come true, that Jesus is, in fact, the stem of Jesse, the mighty one of Jacob. He's the messenger of the covenant. He is the long-awaited prophet, priest, and king for Abraham's descendants. Bartimaeus knows this is great David's greater son, the greatest gift to Israel. 
This title is pregnant with expectation. But my friends, Jesus Christ is not just the one that the Jews have been waiting for. He is the one we've all been waiting for. He is the seed of the woman who has crushed the serpent's head. He is the second Adam bringing justification to those that believe. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the only mediator between God and man. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not our sins only, but also for those of the whole world. He is God of God, light of light. He is King of kings, and He is Lord of lords. He's the one we've all been waiting for. Bartimaeus knew it. Do you see what Bartimaeus sees? He knows he's not just the son of David. Notice he also knows Jesus is the source of mercy. He calls him son of David two times. Then he says, have mercy on me two times. Bartimaeus knows that he has no status, no platform, no resume, no money. He has no connections. He has nothing by which to impress Jesus. If Bartimaeus is going to receive anything, he is not depending on any merit of his own. He is fully banking on God's mercy. And my friends, that is the only hope that any one of us in this room has. Romans 9.16 says it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. If you are a Christian here today, it's not because you are a beautiful woman. It's not because you are a powerful man. It's because Jesus is a merciful Savior. That's why the first beatitude is so important. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It belongs to those who know and recognize that they're morally and religiously bankrupt. Another way to say it is blessed are the spiritual beggars. That's what Bartimaeus recognizes he is. And there is a sense in which every single one of us, like Bartimaeus, must begin at that point. I've heard it said before that hell will be full of people who think they deserve heaven, while heaven will be full of people who know they deserve hell. And Bartimaeus is one of those people. Have mercy on me. The Bible uses the metaphor of blindness in many cases. In 2 Corinthians 4, Paul says that Satan has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, we are surrounded by men and women who are spiritually blind. There are blind men and women in Forrest and Lynchburg in Virginia, all throughout our nation, in Guatemala, all around the world, whose only hope is the mercy of Jesus. You may be here this morning, and you may not think of yourself as being blind in this way, but is it possible that you are? Is it possible that you are deceived? We sang a song last Sunday that said it so much better than I ever could of what we believe and what we confess and where our hope comes from. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty. At Calvary. Why? Because Jesus is not only the son of David, he's not only the source of mercy, he is the one we've all been waiting for. Do you see what Bartimaeus sees? That's not all he sees. In verses 49 and 50, he also sees, number two, that Jesus is worthy of our full surrender. Jesus is worthy of our full surrender. You can just imagine the crowds hushing him and shushing him, telling him to sit down and be quiet, but Bartimaeus is yelling and waving and hollering and doing whatever he can to get Jesus' attention. And guess what? It works. Verse 49, And Jesus stopped and said, Now, I don't want to spend too much time here, but those might be my three favorite words in this whole passage. And... Jesus stopped. Yet again, we see the compassion of our Lord towards the marginalized and the hurting. 
He is on his way to do the most important thing on earth that anyone has ever done, and yet he stops to take the time for this blind man. Who has time for a poor beggar? Who has time for a disabled person? Who has time for the pariahs and the outcasts and the homeless? My friends, Jesus has time. That's who. Jesus didn't just tell us the story of the Good Samaritan. Jesus is himself the Good Samaritan. He stops when nobody else will. Will we follow in his example? Do we pass the disabled without a second thought? Do we step over the beggars and ignore them? Do we take notice of those pleading for help? Jesus did. He stopped and said, call him here. So they called the blind man, saying to him, Take courage, stand up, he is calling for you. The attitude of the people change once Jesus steps in. They had been hushing him, and now they're inviting him. The Nasby says that they said to him, Take courage. I usually don't disagree with the Nasby, but I do here. I think that's way too formal sounding. Take courage. You know, it's something medieval people say. When he's, they say it's, it's more something like, Hey man, it's okay. Calm down. I can almost imagine being blind and the people hushing him and shushing him. Bartimaeus might have been, you know, throwing haymakers, trying to do whatever he could because this is his only chance. And they say, hey, hey, calm down. It's okay. Listen, he's calling you. Come on, we'll, we'll, we'll help you. Let's, let's go there and see him. Notice verse 49, there's, three, there's a word repeated three times. It says, call him here. So they called the blind man, and they said, He is calling for you. If you've paid attention in Mark's gospel, you know that word call has deep discipleship implications. Back in chapter 3, Jesus called the disciples to himself. In chapter 2, he said, I have come to call the righteous, or not to call the righteous, but to call the sinners. It's a buzzword that has such deep meaning. And so when it says, call him here, and so they called the man, and he is calling for you, there's a sense in which Jesus may have simply said, come here, but what Bartimaeus heard was, follow me. It's like John 10, where Jesus describes the good shepherd as the one who calls his own sheep. He said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And Mark adds this wonderfully vivid detail in verse 50, throwing aside his cloak. It says, he jumped up and came to Jesus. Do you remember that last few uh, pages of uh, Dickens' A Christmas Carol? When Scrooge has his revelation? Remember that last couple of scenes where he's like dancing and bouncing and running through the house and sliding down the banisters, right? He's all just like a kid on Christmas, right? That's what I imagine Bartimaeus here, just Filled with excitement, filled with enthusiasm, he jumps to his feet, it says, and he came to Jesus. Now, I think we are supposed to compare this response to one we saw earlier. Bartimaeus wasn't the only man Jesus called to follow him and to come to him. Earlier in chapter 10, we met a man who was not a blind beggar, but he was a rich ruler. And Jesus called the man and said, come, follow me. And he confronted his materialism and called him to repent and said, go and sell all your possessions and and, and give it to the poor. And the man went away grieving. Why? Because he owned much property. He loved his stuff more than he loved the Savior. He wasn't willing to give it up. The rich young ruler wasn't willing to surrender it. But notice what Bartimaeus does. Verse 50, throwing aside his cloak. A cloak was not just a random robe. It was often a multifunction article of clothing that had many purposes. It could be used as a jacket for warmth, as a shade from heat, as a blanket for comfort, as a pillow for sleeping, as a knapsack for carrying, or as a mat for sitting on. And if you lived on the streets as a beggar, a cloak may have been one of the most important things and most valuable things you owned. Who knows, it may have been one of Bartimaeus' last earthly possessions. But he throws it aside to come to Jesus. This reminds me of that 
of a character that most of you may know. You know, um, Peanuts, Charles Schultz, Charlie Brown, Snoopy, all them. One of the characters is a, a young man named Linus, if you remember. And every time you see Linus, Linus is carrying that, that blue little blanket that he has. Every frame that Schultz ever drew in the papers, every time that Linus is there, he's holding that blanket close as his security blanket, his prized possession. But there's one time in the history of Peanuts when Linus puts it down. If you remember the Charlie Brown Christmas special, which I can't believe they still show on TV because he quotes Luke 2, you know, like the whole thing. But he does. And there's a moment when Linus is quoting it. He says, what? Do not be afraid, for I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For there is born for you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And Linus lets go of the blanket. My friends, if Jesus is your security, you need no earthly security blanket. There is nothing more valuable than Jesus. What did Paul say? I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ. I count all things as rubbish so that I may gain Christ. My friends, what are you holding on to? What is your security blanket? Is it a job? Is it a relationship? Is it a sport? Is it an accomplishment? Is it a degree? Is it a promotion? What is it that you are finding your identity, your meaning, your purpose in? Are you willing to let it go? Bartimaeus saw that Jesus is worthy of his full surrender. For Bartimaeus, Jesus was now his plan A, and there was no plan B. Spurgeon once said, I have a great need for Christ. Even more, I have a great Christ for my need. That's what Bartimaeus realized. He could have sang that old hymn which says, All to Jesus I surrender. Do you see what blind Bartimaeus sees? There's a final valuable insight, verses 51 and 52. Bartimaeus also sees, number three, that Jesus is able to restore the broken. Jesus is able to restore the broken. Verse 51, in answering him, Jesus said, what, what do you want me to do for you? Now, this should sound familiar. If you were here last week, you know that exact question has already been asked. Back in chapter 10, verse 36, he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? The question that Jesus asks Bartimaeus here is the same question that he just asked James and John. Now, it's the same inquiry, but they give two vastly different responses. James and John want power. James and John want glory. James and John want significance. They want notoriety. They want to sit at his right and his left. And what does Bartimaeus want? Rabboni... I want to regain my sight. What a simple, meek, and lowly request. There was no doubt that this was Bartimaeus' actual personal physical need that he wanted to see. But if he knew his Old Testament like it appears he did, Bartimaeus may have also known that one of the marks of the Messiah is that he would open the eyes of the blind. And so when he says, I want to regain my sight, he is saying, I want to see Isaiah 26, 35, and 42 fulfilled right now. Bartimaeus is saying, I have summoned you, and I have heard you, and I have believed you, and Lord, all that's left is I now want to see you. It reminds me of Johnny Erickson Tata, the author and Christian speaker who's a quadriplegic. She recently wrote, quote, The first thing I'm going to do with my resurrected legs is to fall down on grateful knees to my Savior. That's Bartimaeus. I want to see you. He's called him son of David. He also calls him Rabboni, which is a stronger form of rabbi, like my master. He humbly submits himself to the authority of Christ. And so Jesus said to him in 52, Go, your faith has made you well. 
Most of your Bibles have a footnote there, as they should. I think there's a subtle double meaning here. Where it says, your faith has made you well, it can also be translated, your faith has saved you. You see, I would argue there's two miracles happening in that verse. Jesus not only heals a sightless man, He also saves a sinful man. And how does He save us? By faith. That's why Hebrews 11.1 1 says that faith is the conviction of things not seen. Bartimaeus had not yet seen the kingdom, but he is convinced that Jesus is the king. He's not yet seen the crucifixion, but he is convinced that Jesus is the source of mercy. He has not yet seen, like us, the return of Christ, but he is convinced that Jesus is the all-powerful one who can bring about the healing of our bodies that we will one day have and the final restoration of all of creation that moans and groans and longs for it. And so, immediately, he regained his sight. And the first thing that Bartimaeus sees is what? The face of Jesus. Can you imagine that? He opens his eyes and he sees the Lord. And what he saw and experienced in that moment was so lovely, it was so captivating, it was so life-changing, it was so irresistible, it says he, quote, began following him on the road. Right then, right there. And my friend, you can follow him too, right now. Notice the man who started out in verse 46, by the road, ends up, verse 52, on the road, following Jesus. He knew where Jesus was from, but he also knew where Jesus was going. He was going to Jerusalem. He was making his way to the place of suffering. He was on his way to the cross, not only into the city of David, but he was also going to the, to the cross of Calvary. And Bartimaeus, seeing Jesus, he said, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Do you, do you see what Bartimaeus sees? The world tells us that seeing is believing. This passage tells us that believing is seeing. See, the question is not just simply, do you believe, do you see what blind Bartimaeus sees, but it's do you believe what blind Bartimaeus believed? If you have never done it before, I invite you Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and like Bartimaeus, thou shalt be saved. Let's pray together. We thank you, Father, for the word. We thank you, Father, for the compassion of Christ. We thank you, Father, for the example of faith we see in Bartimaeus. We thank you, Lord, for this reminder of the treasure and the value of Jesus above all. Lord, we look at our world and we are so quickly deceived by it, so allured by it, but may we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And may we run with endurance the race set before us. Find us faithful, Lord, to Jesus. And help us as a congregation in boldness, in confidence, and in faith to see what blind Bartimaeus sees. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.